It's great to be back, and um, Greg and I were having a conversation about, among other things, our common alma mater. We both went to a place called Swarthmore. And I just learned, he didn't know this until a few minutes ago, that um, Swarthmore turned down Barack Obama for admission. <laughs> and apparently there were some Swarthmore students who were very enthusiastic Obama supporters who went to one of his rallies when he was campaigning in Pennsylvania in the Philadelphia area. And they got up along the rope line and they shook his hand and said, hi, we're all with you. And we come from Swarthmore. And by the way, is it true that Swarthmore turned you down? And he said, yes, and I've never forgotten it. <laughs> so, so I called one of the members of the board of managers, as they call the trustees, and I said, it is true that we turned him down. He said, yeah. And I said, well, why don't you invite him in June and give him the degree that he never had an opportunity to earn because you turned him down. So we will see. Anyway, it's great to be here. Um, and I hope we could, this could be a real dialogue because um, not that I have any special clout in the new administration, but I'm certainly going to do everything I can to be as helpful as I possibly can. I'm sure that's true of all of us, particularly in this in this area. And um, now that I've reached my 75th year, I find myself uh, telling people things that a lot of them don't know. I mean, it may well be that I need no introduction, but if you're under 30, uh, there's very little recognition. As a matter of fact, I was at the Ruggles Station of the Orange Line about a year ago, which is the one right next to Northeastern, which I use all the time. And I was down on the platform, and a young guy came up who I guess was maybe 17 or 18, and he said, hey, he said, ain't you the mayor? <laughs> <laughs> so you, you got to be a little elderly to know who I am these days. Um, but there's a lot of history here, which may be old hat to some of you, but I suspect not to all of you. As I began... Uh, getting into politics in this state uh, after I got back from my service in Korea in the late 50s and I was going to the law school up the street. Um, the planning orthodoxy of the time prescribed for every metropolitan area in the country what, for lack of a better word, I'd describe as a California-style freeway system. Now, as all of you know, those of you familiar with, certainly with, with transportation planning in Europe, they have very good highway systems. In fact, they're a hell of a lot better maintained than ours. I mean, you know, their bridges look as if they were painted yesterday, and ours look as if they were painted about 25 years ago, which is not unusual in this state. I mean, we've got bridges around here that haven't been painted since I left office. Um, but generally speaking, there's a ring road around major cities, and the highway terminates at the ring road. I mean, the highway, the, the, what we would call their interstate or national highway system terminates at the ring road. Inside the ring road and, and inside and outside the ring road, there's a usually uh, highly developed, uh, well-run and well-maintained public transportation system. And if you want to drive through the ring road into town, good luck to you, but that's not the preferred way to do it. Here, for reasons I'm not sure I understand, and I suspect there are people here who know more about this than I do, uh, although I think that was the original plan. Uh, within a relatively short period of time, we just started ramming these first four, then six, and then eight-lane highways right through cities. And uh, Boston was no exception. The Master Highway Plan, which, believe me, was the planning orthodoxy of the time, or in the 50s and 60s, essentially uh, consisted of six eight-lane highways coming right through 128, which would have been our ring road, and was our ring road to some extent. Um, and then, of course, if you did that and nothing else, you'd have a massive traffic jam in the middle of the city. And so we were going to build an inner belt highway, eight lanes elevated, right through Frederick Law Olmsted's Emerald Necklace, which would encircle the city coming from the Southeast Express Expressway, kind of down what is now Melnia Cass Boulevard, Ruggles, right through the park, just in front of Emanuel and Simmons. You with me? Over the river smashing its way through Cambridge and Somerville and circling around and connecting on the other side. And in fact, there's a, there's a bit of a stub. I don't know if it's still there. I think it's still there. Still, still, still there, there, right? Where the thing was supposed to hook back into the... Uh, anyway. Um, and uh, when I was elected to the legislature in 1962, 
I was already beginning to have some doubts about this thing. By the way, in the meantime, the tea was going to hell in a handbasket. I mean, no investment, terrible management, full of political patronage, and falling apart for all practical purposes. And as a young lawyer in the early 60s, I'd take it to work, and it would break down three days out of five, easy. And we had the old PCC cars, which uh, basically threw you into the aisle every time they went around a curve on the Riverside Line, other places. Um, and that was transportation. And there were a small band of five of us, myself, felony Bill Homans, who had just been elected from this part of Cambridge, uh, an old timer named John Toomey from, from East Cambridge, uh, and, and a couple of other folks in the legislature that began raising questions about this. Um, but even my friends in the planning profession said to me, no, no, you got to build this, you got to build it, you got to build it. I kept saying, I think there's something wrong with this picture. It's going to cost a, a ton of money. It's going to destroy a lot of what is unique about Boston, which, by the way, was going through what every other major urban community in America was going through, severe deterioration all over the place. Um, those were the days of the Park Plaza project and all this kind of stuff. And, um, and so we began meeting together. We began connecting with some of these neighborhood groups through whose neighborhoods this thing was going to go. But the entire establishment was, was for this. You just had to do it. If you're going to save the city, you had to build this thing. Um, and I finally said to my pals in the legislature, look, one of our problems here is that we don't have anybody who has technical competence here. I mean, it's just us guys. And we're all kind of special pleaders because we represent districts that are going to be affected. There's got to be somebody in this town who agrees with us. And I spent several months walking around trying to find that person. And finally, somebody said to me, there's this Italian kid that just came back from Italy in a Fulbright who's working as a transportation planner for Ed Logue at the BRA. His name's Salvucci. I think he agrees with you. So I picked up the phone. I said, Fred Salvucci, I'm Mike Dukakis, state representative for Brookline. I want to talk to you about transportation and highways. And I don't know whether, whether we had lunch or what we did. In any event, and Fred just laid out a rationale for not building the Master Highway Plan, and instead dramatically shifting to public transportation that was brilliant. And that's where Dukakis and Salvucci first connected, never to be divided again. <laughs> um, and as many of you know, I mean, this was early mid-60s, and we kept working at this and working at this working as Kevin White was elected mayor. Fred became his transportation advisor. Uh, he then turned on the Master Highway Plan. And then Frank Sargent, who had been one of the architects of the Master Highway Plan, in one of the gutsiest decisions any governor's ever made, essentially stopped, reviewed, listened, studied, and said, we're not going to do this. And took a lot of punishment politically for doing so from the construction industry and the building trade unions and building you know, trade, trade unions and so on. Um, and then I beat Sargent in 74 after he had made his decision. And at about the time, a sainted man named Thomas P. O'Neill, Jr. made it possible for this state to take those interstate highway dollars that we had decided we didn't want and spend them for public transportation. And we were the first state in the country to be permitted to do that. Prior to that time, as some of you may recall, you couldn't bust the highway trust fund. It had to be used for... Highwaymen. If you didn't use it for highwaymen, you couldn't use it for anything. And not only that, but with a little help from Fred, we made sure that we got the money at its inflating value. So we ended up with about $3 billion worth of what would have been highway money, which we could invest in the public transportation system. And while well, I think the T today has got some problems, especially on the construction side, I mean, if I go through Kenmore Square one more time, you know, with, with the thing still unfinished, I mean, with the serious construction management problems there and elsewhere. But uh, there's no question that all of that, and Fred's leadership unquestionably, and very strong support from a very supportive legislature, made it possible for us to do a lot of things. We, if you can believe this, we literally acquired the entire commuter rail system in eastern Massachusetts, with the exception of what was then Conrail, now CSX their pieces, which we have now had to pay hundred million bucks for. The entire commuter rail system in eastern Massachusetts, tracks, stations, parking lots, such as they were, for a total, are you ready for this? 
of 35 million bucks, 1976, which gives you some idea of how we valued this unbelievable resource. And of course, in the meantime, and at the same time, the private railroads in this country were essentially saying, that's it, we're getting out of passenger rail. We're out of here. You can have this stuff, you can have all this equipment, you take it, we don't want it. And it was John Volpe, interestingly enough, in the late 60s, who was the Secretary of Transportation, former governor of Massachusetts, the Secretary of Transportation, who convinced Nixon that creating something called Amtrak made sense. But it was all happening about the same time. And of course, rail service in the country deteriorated very badly during that 50, 60 period. It was really awful. And Amtrak was created. Well, okay, that was then, this is now, um, in this and some other metropolitan areas in the United States, we now have what I would characterize as, as relatively good public transportation systems. That's the exception rather than the rule. I mean, you go out, go out to these western cities, with the exception of Portland, Oregon, you know, they followed Los Angeles's example with perfectly predictable consequences. And that's true whether you're talking about Phoenix or Denver or a variety of other places. And it's only been within the past handful of years recently that places like Denver have voted to tax themselves to build a rail-based metropolitan transit system. Um, but Denver followed Los Angeles uh, almost to the letter in building this uh, freeway system. And if you've ever tried to get anywhere at 3 o'clock on a Friday afternoon in Denver, you know, you know the consequences of this. Well, okay. Um, now, in the meantime, with Fred's leadership and a certain amount of pushing from me, this state in the 80s became, I think it's fair to say, the lead state among all of the Northeast states in pushing for major improvements in the Northeast Cart, Boston, Washington. And... Um, with some degree of success. I mean, we were facing an administration that wanted to get rid of Amtrak, consistently zeroed it out. I mean, Reagan would z literally zero out Amtrak in its budget. It wasn't, it wasn't a question of cutting it. It was just getting rid of it. Um, we managed to stave that off. And then with considerable support in the Congress, actually starting in the mid-'70s, we began to make modest improvements in the Northeast Corridor. In fact, President Ford signed the first Northeast Corridor bill. Um, and then we had to fight the Reagan administration, pretty consistently, but with <clears throat> some support from, from the Congress. And so um, when Bill Clinton was elected, uh, we finally got a president who was moderately supportive of all of this, that is, of the notion that this country needed a first-class national rail passenger system with uh, much higher speeds between cities uh, in the three to 400-mile range. But, uh, and he's a dear friend of mine, as you know, he nominated me in Atlanta. As a matter of fact, one of his longest speeches, one of, wasn't one of his best speeches, and it wasn't all his fault. I mean, we took a look at the script and thought it was okay, but it just went on and on, and, and the, the crowd at the convention in 88 was getting kind of nervous, and so on, and applauded enormously when at the end he said, in conclusion, and the place kind of, <laughs> and, and uh, a little unusual, because Clinton delivers a great speech, and um, when he announced... <laughs> When he announced for the presidency in the fall of 1991, he went on Johnny Carson, and Carson said, why are you running? He said, because I want to finish my speech with Dukakis. <laughs> um, anyway, and he had talked about high-speed rail as one of his six or seven cutting-edge technologies, which he was going to emphasize. But while he was moderately supportive, uh, we never got the kind of push from the Clinton administration that I expected we would get. And in fact, uh, John Podesta, who you may recognized the guy that's now running the Obama transition and was uh, Clinton's last chief of staff said that when they put me on the Amtrak board, they created a monster. I, I don't know about that, but I mean, I was, I, was, I was doing my best. And in fact, I remember sending Clinton a, a memo saying, look, you should be the Eisenhower of the steel interstate. You know, even as Dwight Eisenhower was the father of the interstate highway system, I want you to be the father of the the president who built what I like to refer to as the steel interstate. Just couldn't get him to do it. And I don't understand it, to tell you the truth, because he's a bright, creative guy. He certainly was into this. He talked about it during the campaign. Um, he was nice enough to put me on the Amtrak board, along with some other very good people. It was a 
bipartisan board. Tommy Thompson was the chairman of the board. I was the vice chairman. It was one of the best boards I've ever served on. Served on. Um, but with the exception of, a, of, of an injection of money uh, to, to do the Northeast Carter and, and electrify it fully from Boston, Washington, and the rest of it, we never really got the kind of leadership there that I had hoped we would get. Um, and when Bush two came in, we basically got Reagan redux, only worse. Um, I served on this bipartisan board with some of the best Republicans I've ever served, with Thompson being one of them. Um, our president today made sure that every single one of us was removed from the board at midnight of the 365th day of our fifth year in office. And in point of fact, a number of us thought that, that he couldn't do that, that, you know, we had a right under the law to stay. It was a little ambiguous in terms of the statute. We had a right to stay on until we were replaced. And in fact, I thought Kerry was going to win in 2004. Rondo. So I and some of my fellow Democratic members of the board that had been removed were all set to go back there on the 17th of November, walk into the offices of Amtrak, say, hi, we're back. Thank you very much. We were illegally removed in the first place. And of course, my former lieutenant governor in our United States Senate didn't make it. And so that was that. Well, OK, that was then, it was 2008. And uh, we've just elected a new president and vice president who have said on more than one occasion this is going to be the most train-friendly administration in history. And that's particularly something that we've heard from Joe Biden, who, as all of you know, has been riding Amtrak regularly from Wilmington to Washington and back. Now, apart from all of this, what's the rationale for this? Well, I think it seems to me, and I may be wrong and feel free to disagree, but I don't know how you could look at the world that we're facing did not conclude that this country needs a first-class national rail passenger system, especially in these inner-city corridors. But since connectivity is a very important part of this whole thing, and those long-distance trains are very important to the states through which they run. Talk to the folks in Montana about the Empire Building. I mean, it's a critically important link for them. Um, and since the rail network effectively is there, now, that doesn't mean it doesn't need improvement, double tracking, a variety of other things, but the real estate is there, folks. I mean, you, don't take, you don't have to take a single house, you don't have to take a single business. Um, we have this remarkable rail network, and as some of you, maybe all of you know, outside of the Northeast Cor Corridor, where thanks to the Penn Central bankruptcy, Amtrak now owns the system, and in effect, allows the freights, accommodates the freights, but it's, it's Amtrak that's the owner. Um, in the rest of the country, Amtrak runs over the lines of the existing freight railroads, many of which used to be double-tracked and now single-tracked. And one of the reasons these long-distance trains, or for that matter, some of these Carter trains, have such difficult times meeting their schedules is because they're running on single tracks with freight trains that keep stopping in the middle of the thing and doing, you know, crew changes at noontime and and Amtrak trains behind them and so on and so forth. Um, so one of the improvements that it would seem to me that we ought to be making if we're serious about investing in this thing would be double tracking, separating passenger and freight and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but the real question, I think, for all of us is, are we going to make significant long-term investments in what I would characterize as the first-rate national rail passenger system? Now, it may not be 200-mile-an-hour trains, European style or Japanese and now increasingly Asian style. Um, but we could certainly run trains at 115, 120, 125 on existing rights of way or existing corridors between cities, and that wouldn't be bad. That would be a huge improvement of what, what we've got today. Um, and one of the things that I think is interesting about all of this is that this notion of building and operating a first-class national rail passage system has huge public support. I mean, this is a case where the, pol the public is way ahead of the politicians. You look at national polls and so forth. I remember when I was on the Amtrak board, and I think we had had about three derailments in a month, and the Washington Post went out and took a poll. And it's still, the, the numbers were overwhelming. People wanted Amtrak supported, interestingly enough. Well, this is now translated into a broad bipartisan majority for serious investment 
in a national rail passenger system in Congress. And we've just gotten the best Amtrak bill that's ever come out of Congress, approved with veto-proof veto majorities, um, and amazingly signed by the president. I suspect because of the word veto-proof majorities, because this is a president did whatever he could to shrink the system, get rid of the system, and so on and so forth. Um, so that's very good news. And we now find ourselves in the middle of an economic crisis where I would hope the new administration, the new Congress, would get serious about a stimulus package that emphasizes investment in public infrastructure, folks. Whatever you think of what the Treasury is doing and the bailout packages and the automobile industry and so on, I mean, I think we can agree that one important component of any kind of recovery plan ought to be major investments in public infrastructure. And I'm not talking about the WPA. I mean, we're talking about stuff that's there, much of which is in serious disrepair, as well as the kind of thing that I'm talking about here this afternoon. And, uh, and I hope and expect that that's going to be, that's what we're going to see. But the framework is now there. The new bill, the Amtrak authorization bill, really, really has just about everything the system needs to get cracking. And we're not talking about a huge amount of money. Um, Three billion a year invested in this would do it. That's a week in Iraq. Three billion a year. We're not talking about huge amounts of money. Uh, if we could get more, that would be great. I just talked to the, the, the uh, Amtrak CEO, just resigned a couple of days ago, and I, a guy named Alex Kuman, who I don't know particularly well. He's no Dave Gunn, but he's a pretty good guy, and I don't understand what this is all about. Um, but um, in any event, I talked to the acting CEO who's been the, the um, vice president for operations, a very good guy named Bill Crosby, and, and I said, if we could come up with a significant amount of money as part of the stimulus package for you, he said, we are ready to go. We are ready to go tomorrow on major corridor improvements. Where? Well, just about everywhere, folks. The four southeastern states, Virginia, the Carolinas, and Georgia, for years have been asking that the Northeast Corridor be renamed the Atlantic Corridor and that high-speed service be extended from Washington to Richmond to Charlotte to Raleigh to Atlanta. One of the reasons Trent Lott was a huge supporter of Amtrak is because of the so-called Gulf Corridor. And if you tried to drive from Birmingham to Atlanta on a Friday afternoon, you'll understand why. That's Atlanta to New Orleans. Florida got deeply into this super high-speed $20 billion thing, which Jeb Bush killed. But the fact of the matter is that for a tenth of that, you could take the existing rights away in Florida and turn them into an excellent rail system for Florida. And if you've ever tried to drive on I-95, particularly in South Florida, you know what I'm talking about down there. I mean, every time Kitty and I go down there, they're widening I-95 with uh, perfectly predictable results. Within two years, the place is a moving parking lot again. You know, you just keep doing this and doing this and doing this. But they have an excellent existing rail network in Florida, which could easily be converted jointly with the freights into a first-rate 110, 115 mile an hour rail system. The Midwest and the 10 Midwestern states for the last seven or eight or nine years have been pushing hard for a much improved, higher speed, again, 110, 120 mile an hour rail system connecting Chicago with each of the major Midwestern cities, all of which, by the way, with the exception of Minneapolis, are within the magic 400 mile. I mean, whether it's Chicago, Detroit, Chicago, <coughs> Cleveland, Chicago, Cincinnati, Chicago, Columbus, Chicago, uh, Champaign, Urbana, Chicago, St. Louis, Chicago, Des Moines. I mean, they're all kind of in there. And so the Midwestern states have been pushing for this. It would cost half the cost of the proposed expansion of O'Hare. And a third of the flights out of O'Hare are for less than 350 miles. Doesn't sound too complicated. Um, and on the West Coast, both Oregon and Washington with the so-called Cascades, which runs today from Vancouver to Seattle to Portland, and California, which Interestingly enough, uh, is not only one of the best Amtrak states, but where rail ridership is skyrocketing. The capital corridor, San Jose to Sacramento, has quintupled ridership over the past eight or nine years. And they're only going 80 miles an hour. You know, it's not as if this is, but if you've tried to navigate the California freeways you, these days, you'll understand why uh, now. 
Interestingly enough, not only did virtually every initiative for increasing taxes to invest in public transit pass, and there were a flock of them on the ballot, but the voters of California have now voted to go ahead with a serious, truly high-speed system, 200, 220 miles an hour, which will connect Sacramento, San Francisco, San Jose, Central Valley, right down that spine, Los Angeles, Riverside, and San Diego with modern, truly high-speed trains on exclusive rights of way. And you'll be able to go from downtown Los Angeles, downtown San Francisco in 2 hours and 40 minutes, downtown, San, downtown Los Angeles, downtown San Diego in 55 minutes. And the voters of that state, with all of its financial problems, have voted to do that. So I don't think there's any question about the public support for this. I don't think there's any question that this is the time to do it. Any of us know that when the economy's down, that's when you want to get out to bid with this stuff. Um, it's not an accident that we cleaned up Boston Harbor at a cost that was 25% below estimates because there were some people over there that had the good sense to get those contracts out to bid during the 89-91 recession, and contractors were hungry and came in with uh, bids that were well below estimates. Of course, two or three years later when the economy revived, they were coming in with hundreds and hundreds of change orders, but fortunately the, <laughs> the folks at, at the MWRA were quite resistant to that. But uh, for all kinds of reasons, I mean, part of it just the importance of, of, of building this system and, and, and getting people to work at, if not bargain basement, very reasonable costs. This is a great time to get going on this thing. And to repeat, the folks at Amtrak say they're ready to go. Um, so I think it's a no-brainer. Now, what's it going to take? Well, um, certainly a stimulus package with some money allocated for rail would help in addition to the new Amtrak bill. Um, imagine if the so-called $160 billion stimulus package, remember the $600 checks, half of, which we, half of which were used to pay down credit card debt and the other half of which were used to buy stuff from China or someplace. You know, not much stimulus there, folks. Supposing that had been socked into public infrastructure. You know what the Massachusetts, just on a per capita basis, divided among the 50 states, you know what the Massachusetts share of that would have been? Three and a half billion dollars. Think about it. I mean, I think I'm right in saying what, Armando? A billion dollars worth of infrastructure spending creates about 30,000 jobs. It's 100,000 jobs. Rebuilding this state's uh, badly, badly uh, hurting infrastructure and getting cracking on some, some serious problems. And, um, and, and that's just an example of what's possible. Now, there is a problem, in my judgment, certainly in this state, and uh, in other states as well. Construction management is a disaster. And frankly, I can't understand why. Now, you know, I tried to run an administration, and I had a Secretary of Transportation, an extraordinary guy, and who in turn identified extraordinary people to do the work. But for the life of me, I don't understand why it's taken five years to do Kenmore Square. Um, we did a lot of tunneling when I was governor. One of them happens to be just down the street, right? Harvard Square to Elwood. It was on time, it was on budget. It's 100 feet below the surface. I don't remember any collapsing ceilings. I don't remember, you know, any of this kind of stuff. Um, the Callahan Tunnel was built, built in two years, back in the 1950s. Um, but it's taking us an inordinate amount of time to build stuff. And I don't think we're alone. I think this is true in other parts of the country as well. And I'll be damned if I can understand why, folks. My stop on the Riverside line is Longwood. They've been doing a platform job there. They're in their second year of a platform job. It should have taken a couple of months. Well, I'm serious. And there are people in this room that have been more deeply involved in the construction process than I have, except for my political perch. But it's all about what? It's all about planning, execution, and getting plenty of people on the job. I mean, I don't understand why there are 100 people down there at Kenmore Square just finishing that job. So if we're going to have an infrastructure package, one of the things that the new administration is going to have to do, in my opinion, is bring the governors to Washington, sit them down, and have a nice but a serious chat about how you get this money out and people employed 
as quickly as possible. Now, during the Carter administration, some of you old enough to remember this may remember that there was a local public work stimulus package that was actually passed. And the condition was you had to, the thing had to go out to bid and be awarded within 30 days, and it had to be in the ground within 60. And we did, I can take you around the state and show you the results of that, that particular program, and that was a fairly modest one. But I do think that the new administration, if it's going to do this, and Congress is going to support this kind of thing, has got to insist that there be serious, first-rate management of this stuff. So we'll, on the one hand, have the desired effect, and on the other hand, get us the infrastructure improvements we're talking about. Um, but improving rail is relatively easy, folks. As, as, as I say, there's not a lot of property acquisition to do. We've essentially got those rights away. Um, we've got a pretty good relationship with the freights, all things considered. Um, and so, and by the way, freights who might very well benefit from that infrastructure package themselves with improved rail, because they need a good deal of investment. So I'm really quite optimistic about this. Obviously, it will depend on who the new Secretary of Transportation is. That's going to be an extremely important selection, in my opinion, and who in turn that person and the administration bring in to, to manage this whole process. But um, I feel pretty good about this, and I think this is a particularly promising opportunity to get serious and get cracking on something that we should have been doing a long time ago. Now, I don't know what your reaction is to all of this, and I'd be interested in lots of feedback. Again, I don't have a pipeline to anybody, but I'm going to do the best I can to, to, to be as supportive as I possibly can uh, as the new administration comes on board. So if you have any suggestions you want me to convey to <laughs> the folks in Washington, I'll be happy to do it. Yeah. Uh, why are you willing to settle? I mean, you, always, the, you don't want the, the perfect, the enemy, the good, but why are you willing to settle for 115 miles an hour? Now, we don't even have that, of course, in the Northeast Corridor. It's, it's sufficiently slow that I'm sorry to say that my husband won't ride it right. um, to New York. It's just too, yeah. too yeah. long. Yeah. Um, so <coughs> what prospect do you see for improvement there on the Northeast Corridor, and what, and, and, and what is your general feeling about accepting 115 rather than the 200 plus that they're going to go through? Good question. Um, let me deal with the first question first. The problem in the Northeast Corridor is almost entirely a New Haven to New York problem because that overhead catenary system hasn't been overhauled in about 90 years, if you can believe it. So you can't run 100. 50 mile an hour trains between New Haven and New York without ripping, the, ripping that thing down. There are some bridge replacement problems, problems as well. Now, all of these are relatively modest, but we're going to get cracking on them. If you repair that overhead catenary and fix those bridges, we can get you down there in three hours or less. As a matter of fact, when I was governor, we tested a Spanish Talgo train and did it in two hours and 40 minutes. I mean, you know, it's How not, much not much. Not much. Why wasn't it done when you were vice chairman? It's a very good question. It's a very good question because Metro North this is not an excuse because Metro North owns New Haven to New York and getting Metro North to move. I mean, I could barely get them to take the uh, the old toilets and the uh, washing machines and the rest of the stuff that was littering the littering the right of way out of there. I'll never forget. I, I was talking to the Metro North guy at the time, and I said, I said, well, Pete, every bridge is covered with graffiti, and there's more crap in the right-of-way than I've, I've ever seen. It. Can't you clean it up? And he kind of looked at me and blinked, you know. I mean, it is true that I'm kind of obsessive about litter and graffiti generally, but, you know, some people just don't see stuff. I mean, it's, it's kind of interesting. So, you know, you make small steps. Um, but I wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't bother me to have, have I mean, I'd, I'd feel pretty good about having a, uh, Corridor speeds in the in the 110, 115, 120. I mean, Brit, the British system runs what 125 miles an hour or something like that. It's pretty good. It's pretty good, and and you can do it and do it quickly. Now, why not the other? Because it requires an exclusive right of way. You can't do it over the existing lines. You can't have commuter rail and Carter trains and a certain amount of freight and that kind of stuff. So um, so I would settle for that, and of course it's less expensive and you can do it fairly quickly. Um, but um, but it, it, it's, it, it needs something like the proposed and now, let us hope, um, beginning 
California system, but that will, with the exception of, of the trip into cities and out again, that will be brand new exclusive right away. No other trains will be on those tracks except the high speeds. Yeah. Stopping in Sacramento and not going to Sacramento or to the Cascade. There's a whole Northern California section. I mean, that's and the, the, rail, the railroad driveways are all there. Yeah, but they're owned by the Union Pacific and Burlington, Chicago, and Northwestern, and uh, or is it the other way around? In any event, um, and it's it's up the coast, and it's not the same. Well, but, but is there any chance of having it happen? Well, I don't know that there's a compelling reason for doing so. I mean, the Vancouver, Seattle, Portland Carter is an important one, mm -hmm. and some relatively modest improvements on that with the Spanish Talgos that now run and, by the way, could hit speeds of 140 miles an hour. Uh, could do that. But there's that whole section. Yeah, and you've got and you've got a well, um, you know, they've just voted for. They finally voted to tax themselves to put in about sixty to seventy, mi 70 miles of of rail from from uh, San Francisco up to what is it, Santa Rosa, or someplace up there. That that whole thing. That's not very far. No, no, admittedly, but you know, politics is the art of the possible. I mean. At this point, the fact, there was a lot of opposition to this bond issue. A lot of editorializing against it and all this kind of stuff. You know, the Reason Foundation was out there with its usual stuff and so on. So, so um, it's really kind of amazing that they got that vote. Yeah? Um, the answer to that question is ridership simply isn't there. And relative to the ridership on the main lines, you've got to start somewhere, so you might as well yeah. start with a high volume uh, corridors where the benefits, uh, you know, are very substantial, the public benefits, and the fare box revenue uh, can, you know, make some contribution to construction costs. But, but on, on the Northeast Corridor, back to the Northeast Corridor, uh, we've done any number of studies of traffic and revenue, ridership and revenue, uh, in many corridors in the U.S. And clearly, for 200 to 250 mile distance corridors, you need two hour rail service in order to really compete with air, in, in order to really start serving the bulk of intercity travel. And the problem with the Acela service in the Northeast Quarter at three hours, 20 minutes, is it simply isn't competitive with, you know, with, with air, with the current high-speed common carrier mode, if you will. So I would urge you to, you know, be considering two-hour intercity service between some of these services if you're going to achieve some of the benefits and objectives that we'd all like to see for intercity rail. Well, getting it down to two hours means a lot of investment. Right. Uh, I think we can get it sub three. And my view is that sub three basically knocks out the shuttle. I may be wrong, but all I can tell you is the last shuttle I took, I took one. <laughs> Don't tell anybody, but <laughs> I was speaking at Hofstra out on the island, and they said, well, it would be a lot easier. The thing was empty. Now, maybe that's partly the recession. I don't know what it is, but I'll tell you, I've never been in a shuttle that had so few people, and there weren't a hell of a lot of people going back either. So, so I don't know what's going on. And I think at least one of the shuttles is just about ready to go. So my sense is that, I mean, Amtrak is certainly taking a majority of the market share in that corridor compared to air. It is. But uh, sure, it would be helpful to improve it. Getting service from New York to Washington down to two hours will take pretty significant investment. And again, the question is how much you want to spend on that as compared with some of this other stuff. Uh, Michael, we've been meeting here at the Lincoln Institute for the last two days with uh, planning directors from the 30 largest U.S. cities, right. including Boston. Uh, and the agenda was uh, about two main topics. How they're doing in uh, meeting climate change goals in terms of action plans for greenhouse gas emissions reduction, and what we should be doing about long-range infrastructure planning right. and thinking ahead to both the stimulus package and the reauthorization of the transportation bill. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, they weren't so sure, we're not so sure, of how you strategically approach that legislatively. W where are the opportunities? I mean, we're talking about something transformational here. We can't keep doing what we've been doing in the past. How do you get from the current transportation program to one that might actually meet greenhouse gas targets? Well, I'd certainly be interested in, in 
a lot of ideas in the room on this, and maybe I'm sounding very simple-minded, but I think you start with a very strong commitment to transit and inner city rail for all kinds of reasons that are obvious to everybody in this room. I mean, if you want denser, more active cities, it's rail that gets you that. Um, if we want to do something about greenhouse gases, there's no question in my mind that transit rail gets you there uh, in at least make a significant contribution to that. And I think with a new Congress, Rondo, which may, I mean, they tell me that Al Franken's going to win in Minnesota, and uh, Begich has already has just won in Alaska. That gets you to 59, and um, this is going to be a very different Congress than the one even that Bill Clinton had. That's not to say there aren't some moderate Democrats, but on this, on this set of issues, I think there's very little disagreement. Um, so for land use purposes, for, um, you know, for all of the reasons where, why most of us, I suspect, in this room uh, want to encourage denser settlement patterns, development patterns, and so on, I mean, all of this makes sense in addition to the greenhouse global warming and that kind of stuff, and, and I think people get that. Now, the, what I'm concerned about is a stimulus package that begins to look like a Christmas tree. Well, the states want money, so they don't have to cut. You know, I'm sympathetic to that, but, and I understand the, the, the what, uh, the, the, the negative effects of states having to cut in tax at the same time that you're trying to stimulate the economy back to prosperity. So, and I'm a big fan of counter-cyclical revenue sharing. I don't know why we ever got rid of it, and, uh, and I think it was a mistake, and, and it ought to be a, an, an important part of the kind of built-in stabilizers that this country needs when the economy starts going down. But um, I hope there's going to be some real focus on this thing, and that a significant piece of it is going to be transit and rail, so we don't just kind of dissipate it out there. Um, you know, part of the problem with the Clinton stimulus package, in case you've forgotten the $50 billion Clinton stimulus package, which he proposed and which got through the, car, got through the House and then was filibusted to death in the Senate, was that, and I don't fault him and the, then, and, then, and the then First Lady for being concerned about immunization rates in the United States because uh, I think at the time Boston had the best immunization rate for kids arriving in kindergarten of any city in America, 58 percent. Houston's was 11. But they put it in the stimulus package. And so the thing became, you know, one of these Christmas tree vehicles for everybody who wanted something. And they're going to have to fight the earmark stuff. Now, I'm not, you know, a purist on when it comes to earmarks. Uh, and I guess even McCain decided he better stop talking about it. But, uh, <laughs> um, but you can't, um, you know, this thing cannot be 2,000 earmarks. It'll be laughed right out of the place. So, so I don't think there's any question about support in the Congress. I don't think there's any question about support nationally. But this has got to be something with some real focus, and I would hope that the rail and transit thing would be part of that. Yeah, I mean, you've got to have frequencies. One of the reasons that uh, my friend Gene Skarpowski has had such great success with his capital Carter in California is that he has dramatically increased frequencies. I think they're up to 11 or 12. When you do that with good service and on-time service, and he's had great success working with the UP, which is really a very difficult railroad to work with, um, and you start getting your on-time performance into the 90% 90, 90 range or beyond, people start coming. But it was he'll be the first guy to tell you, five frequencies didn't do it. I mean, you've got to increase frequencies. Now, what about rolling stock? Amtrak's got, I don't know, 80 or 100 cars, I don't know what they got, sitting around in Beach Grove, they haven't got the money to repair them. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that's there. They've got to start ordering new equipment. I mean, they've really, really got, to get, got to get going on that. Is it conceivable that we could finally, in this country, b begin making trains again? I teach with a wonderful guy named Dan Mitchell, who's a labor economist at UCLA. We do this undergraduate public policy course together. And he, the other day, I said, well, you ought to do an op-ed piece on this auto bailout thing, Dan. And he wrote me back and he said, interesting idea. He said, instead of just dishing them money, why don't we contract with them for a billion dollars worth of buses? I mean, it just so happens GM is making a hybrid bus. Uh, I think Ford makes the chassis for the buses, but not the, and Chrysler makes buses. I mean, give them a contract for a billion dollars and then turn the buses over to transit systems looking for new buses. Could, 
whether it's the automobile company or something else, we, we had our experience with Boeing when it came to light rail, but I mean, everybody's in a light rail these days. Why can't we make streetcars? And can you somehow use the stimulus package to encourage some of these industries to, to do that? Uh, but there's no question that um, you need more and better equipment. You need many more frequencies. And if you do that, you're gonna see ridership increase dramatically. I mean, getting, getting off the train at 2.30 in the morning is not exactly the experience that people want. And in too many cases, that's what you get. The other comment I made is that the fastest is always high speed. Yeah. Sometimes it's not high speed that's needed. You just need to wear it. Well. Uh, so low speed and more of it. So it also really you know, the down east, your top speed is 80 miles an hour. Ridership is up 30% in one year. Any of you have taken the train to Portland? I mean, it's it, it sure beats driving, folks. I've got a granddaughter I love who's a sophomore at Bates. And I love going up there, but on one condition, she or her boyfriend or somebody meets us at the station in Portland and we drive to Lewiston. I'm not going to do that driving, but it's a, it's a delight. And it's 80 miles an hour. Capital Carter, San Jose, San, Sacramento is only 80 miles an hour. And yet they're carrying huge numbers of people. Now, that's not an argument for slower speeds. All I'm saying is that, and by the way, I have a confession to make. I never knew this until Dave Gunn told me this when we recruited him to be the CEO at Amtrak. Uh, apparently, when we bought the, com the, the commuter rail system in eastern Massachusetts, we could have bought from the B&M, as it was then known, the trackage from the Massachusetts line to Portland for three million bucks. And he was pushing Fred to do it, and Fred said, my God, we're broke. I mean, you haven't lived until you, those of you who weren't here in 1975, I mean, Time Magazine was calling us the new Appalachia, so you get some sense of what life was like around here. And it was just after I'd been elected. And, and Fred just said, how can we possibly spend a nickel on a railroad right away that isn't even in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts? So we lost the chance to, then we put $60 million of your money and mine into the thing and we didn't even take over ownership. So Guilford or whatever they call themselves, uh, Pan Am or something, still owns it and we're running over them. But we could have had that thing for three million bucks, yeah. We all know the important connection between land use policy and transportation, and I wondered if you could speak a little bit about the potential of linking transportation money to, as you might say, correct land use policy. I actually come from Portland, Oregon, where it works fairly well. Uh, people actually walk and bike to the rail yeah. in terms of reducing our uh, carbon footprint and so forth. <coughs> Connecting those two legislatively. Well, you can do that, and it's, it's happening. Um, we certainly do it here. Um, you know, TOD is now kind of the buzzword. Uh, what is it? It's basically encouraging development around the nodes of the rail-based transportation system. And there are a number of states, California is another one, you guys are doing it, we're doing it, where there are very substantial inducements to those communities to develop with greater densities around those, those stations. Um, and at least until the meltdown here, we were getting enormous developer interest. I mean, my experience, and, and I'm sure most of you will confirm this, is all the development community wants is some clear signals as to where you want them and where you don't want them. And some commitment that if they begin to move in the direction you want them to go, that they're not gonna go through four years of uh, endless bureaucratic obstacles, and that you're gonna clear the way and, and move on this. And if you do that, um, they'll come. So. You can link, link these two, and you should, in my opinion, legislatively and administratively, for that matter. And um, when we came up with what I guess in the mid-70s was the first and only state urban policy in the country, I mean, the rail connection was, was essential. Why is Lowell doing so well? Well, part of it involves a lot of investment in the restoration of a lot of that city, but without that rail connection, the uh, people say, well, why do you want to run rail down to Fall River, New Bedford? The single most important investment this state could make in the economic revitalization of southeastern Massachusetts is getting rail down to Fall River, New Bedford. I mean, you do that, folks, and the rest will take care of itself. And you don't need to do an awful lot of encouraging to developers to do that. But we have, we have linked those two legislatively in this state, and we do provide significant 
Let me, let me people follow do it. for a second, uh, Governor, because uh, when, when you were Governor, you had a growth cabinet. Al Rain was the right, guy we wanted right, to talk to, right, right. organize all of the agencies. Right. Uh, Governor Romney had uh, his uh, Doug Foy, growth yeah. cabinet, Doug yeah. Foy, and so forth. Uh, I don't think we quite have that today. Uh, what, what's your sense of the importance of organizing the cabinet around a kind of synthesis of these land use, transportation, economic issues? Got to have it. Now, Deval has one. He chairs it. Which is interesting. I didn't chair my development cabinet. Frank Keefe and then Al Rain did that for a minute. And I was just kind of there to resolve the occasional disputes that took place. But I don't see how you, you cannot have a comprehensive growth policy in a state without a mechanism for implementing it. For me, that was the development cabinet. And it wasn't original with me. I mean, it's an interesting story, folks. I mean, I had a very good sense when I was elected in 1974 that I want to emphasize. I mean, our urban communities in the state were in frightful shape. We had depression-level unemployment rates in the mid-'70s, in the Lowell's and New Bedford. So I'm talking about 23 24 25%. Uh, it was really frightful. And uh, there's no way you can, you can create that kind of policy and implement it without, without an administrative mechanism to do so. Um, and what began happening is that Frank Keefe, who was the first head of the first state office of planning and development, and Fred, and Evelyn Murphy, who was the environmental affairs secretary and so forth, began meeting informally around 4 o'clock on Friday afternoons because, for one thing, I was getting a little unhappy. They kept coming in to me with individual approvals, and I'd say, well, if you talk to Fred or if you talk to Evelyn, if you talk to Frank, why, you know? And, um, and finally, I'll never forget it. Kitty and I went off to uh, Nantucket for a weekend or something. It was a Columbus Day weekend, 75, and Frank said, as I was heading out the door, he said, hand me a memo, and he said, take a, read this and come on back, and it was a kind of full-fledged proposal for this development cabinet thing. And, um, you know, I, I had, that, that thing worked for me every minute of the 12 years that I was governor. I can't imagine effectively implementing this kind of a policy without that. Um, and I was close to it, and I was involved to some extent, but... Um, I didn't think I had to chair those meetings. Deval chairs the meetings. And, uh, you know, I was going to have to make a judgment as to how effective it is. Certainly worked for me. Yeah. I wanted to follow up on two questions that the gentleman in the front raised. And that is to get some more detail on how to move this forward legislatively and also what is the goal of the states and role of state GOT reforms in making that happen. My understanding of how they move things forward in the Midwest um, is, is largely through a creation of a, not a, a standard um, compact in the constitutional sense, but a, a more informal compact with different members of the, the state government that effectively became sort of like a super legislature, and that those folks were then able to become the most effective lobbyists on behalf of these Regionally or within the state? Regionally. So well, a coordinated state effort. And I'm, I'm thinking that for us in the Northeast, we need to have more of a, a block action in terms right. of I agree both with federally and on the state level, and the barrier is at the state DOTs. Well, here's the, here's, here's the situation. There's no, there's no reason why, why this has to be a barrier. Every region has a governor's association. In New England, it's called the New England Governor's Conference. Now, in addition to that, we have something called the Coalition of Northeast Governors, which extends from Maine down to Pennsylvania. I think it ought to be extended, extended to D.C. and Virginia. And when I was governor, I and my fellow governors took these two organizations very, very seriously. And in fact, I was the lead governor on the Northeast Corridor Project, for better or for worse, Dan. You know? um, and of course, Fred was doing the heavy lifting for me, and a bunch of you were working with him. Um, the New England Governors Conference fell into almost total dis disrepair under my successes. And Mitt Romney effectively walked out of the New England Governors Conference, chose not to participate. Now, that's, I don't understand that. How the hell can you be the governor of the largest and, in some ways, I don't want to say most important, but key state in the region if you don't participate in the New England Governors Conference? Um, so, I want to see that revived. I want to see the Coalition of Northeast Governors revived. But the Midwest has its Governors Association. You don't have to create a new institution here. And um, at least in some regions of the country, the governors take this seriously. Now, 
If I were the President of the United States, needless to say, <laughs> as, I, as, I, as I used to say to people in the campaign, what do you think is happening? And my opening line would be, if I knew anything about presidential politics, I'd be here in another capacity. So, uh, yeah. But I would, I would call the governors to Washington around this infrastructure thing, not only to lobby it effectively and well, but I would then use these regional associations of governors to begin to implement it. And I would work very closely with those regional associations. Now, at the same time, the governors have a responsibility here. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the work of the Regional Plan Association in New York and Megalopolis 2050 and so on and so forth. I'm all for it. I think it makes all kinds of sense, but that means that the coalition of Northeast governors really has to be extended to Virginia. And it should be. It's, um, I don't know, I assume, I don't know, but this Midwest Association of uh, DOT secretaries or commissioners that, that came up with the Midwest plan, I think probably did so around, they do have that Great Lakes organization of governors and so on and so forth, which I think encompasses most of the Midwest. But um, we've got, the, we've got the, the institutions are there. It's really a question of empowering them and using them effectively. And, um, and I think, and I, I don't think there's any disagreement about this, the states clearly, after all, the states are the ones that actually do this stuff. And even in the case of Amtrak, the, um, I think there's a very strong feeling that the California model, if I can use that term, makes sense. California, for all its fame as a highway state, puts significant state dollars into rail. And they contract with Amtrak to do it. And it's very, very important. I mean, all of these lines are subsidized. But they've got uh, excellent equipment, uh, good operations, and uh, a lot of that has to do with state support. And the new Amtrak bill, as you probably know, is another 80-20 arrangement in which the states are only, not only going to put up to 20 percent, but are going to have significant responsibilities for executing the thing. So, um, so I don't think you have to reinvent the wheel here or create new, new institutional relationships or organizations. It's there. You've got to use it. And believe me, the governors will respond. I don't think there's any question about it. Who's next? Yeah. I, everybody in this room and most people in the country seem to think high-speed rail is a very good idea. And other than some attitudes and you know, the part of Republicans like Bush and Reagan that if the government does it and it works, we should get right. rid of it. Right. What's stopping it? You know, what stopped it in the past? Are those barriers still there? We really haven't had a president who made this a priority. And um, if the chief executive doesn't make it a priority, even though the Congress, to its great credit, has been fighting those chief executives and, in fact, has now come through, as it did on the Northeast Corridor, with uh, significant legislation and money, then you are in this tug-of-war between the White House and Congress, or for that matter, at the state level if you don't have this kind of thing. Look, this was big for me, as any of you know who, who observed all of this. And, um, and I thought it was a big plus for me politically. I mean, people liked it. <laughs> they really wanted good public transportation. Um, and one of the things that I, one of the, one of the reasons I was puzzled a bit with, with Clinton, who I have a lot of respect for, is probably the most capable guy I've ever worked with in public life is that he didn't quite get into this as I had hoped he would. Um, and that's not a criticism. God, he put me on the board, he put a bunch of us on the board, and, and it was okay. But it didn't seem to me to have the priority position that it ought to have had, and it now demands. So a lot of this is going to depend on, on Barack and, and, uh, and Joe Biden, and he, he kind of started slow with the infrastructure stuff and got stronger at it as time went on. But I kept saying to his people, you know, look, we'll put together a hundred events for him at a hundred different railroad stations surrounded by hard hats. <laughs> and, I, and in fact, at one point I emailed his transportation people, uh, oh, I don't know, a flock of, of ready-to-go projects that would have been naturals for him. I mean, when he went to New Hampshire, I said, I don't know if you know it, folks, but the top transportation priority in New Hampshire is their capital car. Are you familiar with it? Concord to Boston. Believe it or not, New Hampshire's joining the human race. They created a New York, no, they created New Hampshire State Rail Authority. 
serious. New Hampshire has a state rail authority. Now they're having a tough time. You got this big battle over whether or not they can use gasoline tax money for this and so on. But you're talking 200. <laughs> yeah. But but what are you talking about? 200 million bucks. That's the price of an interchange. That would give you first-rate rail service from Concord to Manchester to Nashville to Boston. So, I mean, people are ready, and uh, and I kept saying, look, we'll, we'll set up an, uh, you know, a, an event for, for Barack at the Manch at the site of the proposed Manchester Railroad Station, and we'll surround it with blue-collar, hard-hat guys, and you know, all this kind of stuff. And well, but it, he got stronger at it as time went on, and I think now the economic condition of the country really is 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 compelling. But this is going to take serious presidential leadership. And I hope and expect we're going to get it. Yeah. Uh, first of all, Clinton did grow up in the south of the Sun Belt, and so he probably had no train experience. No? Which I think is... No, there are but, trains, but there are trains my, in the south, you know. I, but not like <laughs> anyway, uh, my question for you is, will the MPOs be a help or a hindrance in this whole infrastructure project? All depends. Um, you know, we're doing a lot of these so-called traffic improvement projects that take forever and cost money, and I don't get it. You know, the BU Bridge in Commonwealth Avenue, what is that? They cut down the size of the sidewalks so the bike riders, are, the, the, the cyclists are bad as hell. And what is it? I mean, we spent money on this thing. I mean, tied traffic, I mean, this, and it's, there's all this stuff, and, and apparently, I don't quite understand the MPO did not get in my way and Fred's way when I was governor. So people say to me, well, it's different these days. I don't know why, but it's not that I'm not a fan of municipal government. I came out of municipal government. But, you know, when, you're, when your state highway system is falling apart, why are we spending money on these little things? Now, that's, that's the highway side of things. Can they be helpful? Well, I would hope so. You know, if they are strongly oriented in the kind of direction that I think we ought to move. But if they're just another obstacle and they're sitting there trying to carve up the pie for little kind of local projects and stuff. I don't think that... Will the federal money be filtered through those organizations? Not for a national rail passenger system, I hope. I mean, I see that as a national priority with the federal government working with the states. I, I don't see... It's not that local... Look, I mean, if you build a capital corridor from Concord to Boston, you certainly expect the folks in Manchester and Nashua and Concord to be deeply and actively involved, and you want them involved. But uh, I would hope it wouldn't run afoul of MPO procedures which get us into this whole bag because, you know, it takes forever and then you end up doing all this little stuff which, uh, you know, at a time when... Does anybody know what's happening at Arlington Station? Can anybody tell me? <laughs> Other than the fact that you got to walk a half a mile backwards in order to get out? What is it? What, what's going on here? You know, now, that's not... It's got nothing to do with the MPO. It's just, you know, it's part of this, this whole thing. I mean, there's some... One or two more questions, I think, we have. I uh, want to just tie back to the land use question for a second. One of the things that, that, that always uh, gets sort of brought up when I talk to people about expanding or improving rail service is that a lot of the land use patterns we have now don't have the densities, and we talked about TOD before, and I understand that. Right. Uh, and they talk about the cost. And it seems to me that one of the things that we may be not focusing on is the planning horizons. How many years out do we really have to look in order to make these things make a lot more sense in terms of cost and, and, and perhaps reorganize some of the land use patterns? Is there any sort of planning horizon that, or any method that you can suggest to talk to some of these things? Well, I don't know that there's a method. I mean, I don't think there's much doubt that rail-based transportation has the kind of land use impact that most of us in this room think is desirable, but it takes time. Um, the so-called Park Square, Park Plaza area of Boston, when we put the Orange Line through that place underground, was a disaster. I mean, it was a place called the Hillbilly Ranch where there were four knifings every Saturday night. I'm not kidding you, for those of you who were not around. Um, the Park Plaza Hotel came that close to being demolished for a parking lot. Serious. And if it hadn't been for a local family, the Saunders family, which got financing from New York, they couldn't get it from the Boston banks, that thing would have been demolished. I mean, that was, there, was a, there was this large parking lot at the corner of what is now Charles and Boylston with one lone building in the middle of it. That was the Playboy Club, surrounded by black. I mean, 
it was a disaster. Combat zone was on the other side and all that kind of stuff. Well, putting the orange line in a tunnel under that part of Boston did not instantly transform the area, but over time, I don't think there's any question that the existence of that, plus a new back base station and so on and so forth, has had a dramatic impact in that area. So I don't think one has to take this on faith, but it's not going to happen immediately. I mean, take a look at Los Angeles. I mean, they used to have the best street railway system in America, and they ripped it up and threw it away. Well, now they try to reconstitute. And they've got a mayor who's a big transit guy. He's going to build that subway to the sea under the Wilshire car if it's the last thing he does. Um, you can already see a change in the development process. Look at Denver. I mean, Denver's downtown was no place to go on a Saturday night. Today, it's not only a very lively downtown, but I mean, you know, the development process really, to, I don't know how many, 15,000 new apartments in downtown Denver, something like that. I don't know what the number is. And it's all about the fact that people are anticipating this new transit system. So um, it'll take time, but it works. I mean, I think it's clear that, that our experience tells us that, um, that this does work, but it won't happen overnight. One more and then we'll wrap up. Yeah. Thank you. I wanted to follow up, Governor, on the South Coast Rail, which is what they're calling the uh, New Bedford yep. Fall River uh, yep. train. I, I don't know if you know or if people in this room realize that that's about to run into an absolute roadblock because the state's environmental groups are almost unanimously opposed to running that through the Hakama. And the uh, South Coast Rail people have rejected most of the other alternatives, even when they would be cheaper or they would, my favorite choice is running it next to uh, 24, so all the people stalled in their cars can see the trains <laughs> really pass. But there are lots of alternatives, and they keep, they keep saying, oh no, through the Hakamak, through the Hakamak, through the Hakamak. And, you know, the environment and transit don't have to be uh, one another's um, uh, horns, but, uh, but that's what's about to happen with this thing. And I, I don't know why. I mean, maybe... Well, look, there may be other alternatives, and I'm not ruling them out, that are affordable. I mean, as it is, I think the notion that this is going to cost a billion, four hundred million dollars, and it's going to take eight years is preposterous. You know, Irish and Chinese immigrants were laying four miles of track a day in 1867. And it's going to take us six years to go through Somerville, an existing right away, four miles of light rail, and eight years to get down there. Now, there is an existing right away through the Hockamock. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's not. And we, got, and, we got, and we got a six lane highway through the Hockamock. And I'm an environmentalist, but I'm, I'm having a tough time dealing with this. And, and quite frankly, I mean, if I were governor, I mean, I'd pull people together. I'd say, look, we want to do this in as environmentally sensitive way as possible, but. If the best way to get from Boston to Fall River, New Bedford, is through the Hockamock, then I'm for doing it if you can. And, 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 and part of this is consensus building and bringing people to the table and, and kind of having a good discussion. Now, there may be, don't get me wrong, there may be alternatives, yeah, there but, are. but there's one alternative that takes about two hours. I'm not for that, you know? So no. I think we gotta, I think we got to look at that. But, uh, you know, as you go down Route 24, look around. I mean, you're in the middle of a swamp. Yeah. And yeah, uh, at least it's, you're not cutting a new uh, swap. Well, a couple of couple of couple of rail lines. It's there. I mean, I, I maybe I'm being a little too pragmatic, but you know, I don't I don't think you you ignore alternatives if they if they're workable, and if they don't cost you in terms of time and huge amounts of money. Um, but let's get on with it, for God's sake. I mean, think about it. You know, eight years to extend rail down there i mean this is preposterous and uh it's it's just another example of what i'm talking about here when it comes to planning and, and executing well, in uh, say, oh, in your campaign when you ran for governor in i guess it must have been 74 yeah. was it um you said exactly this you know we ought to be able to do more than one mile exactly a year, uh, what was and, it, a and, mile and a year? The end, that was it that was yeah. it and and i was a political reporter at that time and after about a year i caught fred Salvucci in 
an elevator and said, well, how much have you gotten done in the first year? And he said, oh, I was so upset when I heard him say that because well, it's not. Let me say this to you. Um, it's not that you want to undermine your own people, but every once in a while, sometimes a governor has to say things publicly, setting targets, even when it upsets the people that work for him because it forces them to to do it. And you know, now that, as I say, now that I've, I've had my 75th birthday, I'm always reminded of John Maynard Keynes' famous comment about folks who think you do things in the long run. Remember what he said, in the long run, we're all dead. Um, and as one approaches one's mortality, that becomes more and more relevant. Anyway, um, all I can tell you is that I hope we're on the uh, threshold of something exciting and important and uh, economy reviving and very important to this country's future. And um, a lot of us can do everything we can to try to see if that happens. Please join me in thanking you.